we want to welcome you as you're coming in and just to be able to um honor our public servants uh, this is this week we honor a lot of our servants and the evergreen chapter of the american society for public administration is one of the many chapters who are hosting events this week um, as a chapter we present um, seminars we uh, provide workshops we uh, host networking events and we also engage in many social activities where we provide an opportunity for our members to come and learn from each other work with each other in in efforts to promote aspa values which is to achieve greater um, effectiveness in government um, generate possibilities for change agents and agents of goodwill to become institutionalized in a network of public service um, we're publishing in various outlets um, not just pro academic but also professional and we really are out there um, leading progressive theory and practice that engage and support global citizenship so this week as i mentioned we're uh, celebrating a number of public servants and I would like to introduce Mary uh, Van Vers, who will uh, walk you through um, some of the participants for our celebratory awards. Mary. Thank you so much, Lucky. Um, what I'm going to do now is introduce J. Paul Blake, who will introduce our keynote speaker coming up next. J. Paul Blake is the retired director of media and external relations at the Daniel J. Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. He recently completed serving his fifth term on ASPA's National Council. His professional service includes three terms as president of ASPA's Evergreen Chapter. In 2013, the Evergreen Chapter awarded J. Paul a Lifetime of Public Service Award. He is a member of ASPA's Endowment Board he chaired the Financial Management Committee and has served on the Governance Com Committee, the Ethics Committee, which revised the Society's Code of Ethics, and the Ethics and Standards Impl Implementation Committee. J. Paul is a recipient of the Donald C. Stone Service to ASPA Award in 2016. He received a Chester Newland Presidential Citation of Merit Award at the 2017, 2018, and 2019 annual conferences. As a member of ASPA's delegations, he has presented papers in Japan and in South Korea. He is a former member of the advisory board for the University of Washington Public Relations and Strategic Communications Certificate Program. His past mem memberships include the International Association for Public Participation, the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, the Seattle Association of Black Journalists, the Black Heritage Society of Washington State, Tabor 100, and Blacks in Government. I welcome my friend Jay Paul to the virtual stage to introduce our keynote speaker. Well, thank you, Mary, for that in invitation, first of all, to uh, be a part of today's uh, program and for your kind introduction. Congratulations to you and your fellow Evergreen Chapter leadership team in organizing uh, this program. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking time to participate in this National Public Service Recognition Week uh, uh, Awards program featuring ASPA's president, Katria delancer Julness. When she assumed the role as president at the recent National Council meeting, Patria said she was very excited to assume the role and have the opportunity to uh, and to continue the work uh, that former President Alan Rosenbaum had started. Patria wants to use the council's brain power to make ASPA a financially robust organization, including creating the capacity to make ASPA more resilient in its fundraising efforts. Patria will lead ASPA for the next two years as she serves as the Rosenthal Endowed Professor of Public Administration and director of the public administration program at the University of New Mexico. Recognized internationally as a scholar and consultant in performance management, government capacity building, and citizen-driven government, Patria brings more than 25 years of experience uh, in public administration, having consulted with government agencies and nonprofit organizations in the United States and abroad to develop effective performance management systems that improve outcomes and serve the public interest. 
She has also authored or co-authored several books along with award-winning articles in major publications. Her article, Promoting the Utilization of Performance Measures in Public Organizations, an Empirical Study of Factors Affecting Adoption and Implementation, was selected as one of the most important influential articles in the 75-year history of public administration review. As an as a NASPA Life member, Patria has served on the National Council and in numerous leadership roles, including co-chairing the Center for Accountability and Performance, and most recently, chairing its Ethics and Standards Implementation Committee and Audit Committee. Patria has worked with governments and universities in Latin America and Europe to improve education and the practice of public administration, building partnerships to improve government capacity, supporting government, uh, democratic governance, and addressing the needs of traditionally underserved populations, including helping low-income high school Hispanic students through partnerships with universities, schools, governments, businesses, and nonprofit organizations. She has been recognized with awards, including Maryland's Top 100 Women by the Daily Record, the Officer's Cross from the Government of Spain, Drum Major for Justice Award for Civic Engagement, the Donald C. Stone Service Award to ASPA, the Julia J. Henderson International Service Award from ASPA Se Section for Women in Public Administration, and it is an elected fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Most importantly, Patria is a friend to the Evergreen chapter and several chapter members. Patria, we're pleased and honored that you accepted our invitation to participate in today's program, and we look forward to your comments uh, and your leadership in the coming two years. Mm. Thank you so much, Jay Paul, for that wonderful introduction. Definitely much more than I could have asked for. And good afternoon, everyone. And also thank you to Professor Angelos, to Mary Vambers, and to David Broom for inviting me. I am honored to be here today, and I am humbled by all the great work that each of you are doing, by the sacrifices that you have made for the public good. And it is such a privilege to serve. And for me, serving as president of the American Society for Public Administration, which means that a lot of ASPA members put their trust in me as they cast their vote, is quite literally not just an honor or a dream, but I feel it's a duty. And as a, I'll share a little bit of my background. As a young person from the Dominican Republic, it never occurred to me that I would be able uh, to be doing this or to be uh, involved in a field that has so much, uh, such a monumental impact on the lives of so many people. When I read the nominations for the awards given today, I was moved and inspired. I was moved by the passion with which the nominator spoke of the candidates, and I was inspired by the background and the work of the candidates that led to the nominators to express such admiration and gratitude. I was also inspired because it reinforces the idea that public service is a call that comes to anyone in many different shapes, forms of expressions, and colors. It is fitting that we are celebrating you today during this week of public service. In my case, as I mentioned, growing up in the Dominican Republic, I pay attention to what my father talked about with his friends when they came to visit. My father and his friends considered themselves these revolutionaries, defenders of the patria. That's my name. It means motherland. It means country. They did not support the government of Joaquin Balaguer, who had previously served as the right hand of a dictator. Rafael Leonidas Trujillo. They would talk about corruption in government. I mean, again, and I was little. I hear them about talking about corruption in government. I hear about journalists being killed by the lead, our despot leader, Balaguer, about a lack of government responsiveness and accountability to citizens, and also about inefficiencies and about object poverty. Somehow, learning about all of these issues around me as a young child motivated me to want to help improve government and nonprofits. And it's not because I sympathize with Balaguer, but because I felt Dominicans deserve better. 
and probably like some of you in your journey to public service, I just didn't realize or didn't know exactly how I could help. I just knew that I felt a passion about it. And a few years later, and I've told this story before, but I, it's a story that I always remember. When I came to the United States and started studying at a university, I thought that pursuing a business degree was the best way to gain skills so I can go back to the Dominican Republic and help as something to promote economic development. But one of my last courses in my undergraduate degree at Rutgers changed uh, the course of my life and my thinking. Uh, the class was called the Social Control of Business. And boy, I do believe in business, but I wanted really, I thought they needed some control. Because in that class, we discussed the need for businesses to be socially responsible and for government to provide the legal and ethical framework that allows businesses to flourish while having a positive impact in society. That was the first time I started questioning my choice in major. Then as I was interviewing for grad school to go for an MBA, somebody mentioned an MPA. That was the first time I ever heard of such a degree. And what can I say? The rest is history. So here I am with you today as the recently installed ASPA president and thinking about charting the next two years of ASPA during the time I will be serving as president and the impact that whatever we do in these two years will have for years to come. I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to participate in this past ASPA annual conference, where we had some very inspiring thoughts and really riveting talks about uh, uh, democracy and threats to democracy and, and, uh, and in, in that line. But one that struck with me was Dr. Fukuyama's remarks. His discussion about the Trump administration's attempt to do away with married employees in the executive branch in favor of political appointees through a Schedule F brought back in my mind the needs to reread Woodrow Wilson's 1887 arguments about the need for a policy administration dichotomy. Equally important in his account, Fukuyama suggested that if citizens didn't perceive government employees, bureaucrats, as non-responsive, as too procedurally driven, very rule bound to the extreme, as inefficient, ineffective. The political claims made by those who refer to servants in the federal government as the deep state would have very little power to influence voters. But what is interesting in that talk is that what I perceived when I was growing up in the Dominican Republic is pretty much what the Trump administration was thinking. But unlike what that meant for them, which was in promoting a Schedule F, for me, it represented an opportunity to help government become better. Now, we could argue that there are many factors that influence these perceptions, but Fukuyama's claims have face validity. While it is true that we have a lot of great examples of excellent public service, with press and company clearly demonstrating this, as Fukuyama said, there are also examples of career bureaucrats who are simply banking on tenure to protect them from being fired for poor performance. He characterized this as the real threats to democracy. And who can forget the stories that we've had in the papers lately of politicians using the already criticized tool of gerrymandering to stay in power? To compound this, we also have seemingly intractable problems and somehow, we have come to believe that democracy can solve everything. But as far back as about 80 years ago, historian Carl Becker in his essays on the dilemmas of democracy already saw that an intrinsic problem at the time, this is 1941, uh, was economic. And he felt it could not be corrected by the method of democracy alone. In my view, the grand challenges that we face today can be tackled if we unleash the creativity and passion of public servants like you who enter public service to do precisely that, solve problems, to achieve positive outcomes for all the people in our society. So what does all this have to do with ASPA and what we are going to do in the next two years and beyond? Well, I think ASPA can help. And as uh, our colleague Terry Gerto mentioned during National Service Award Panel during the ASPA conference this spring, public administration is at the center of solutions. 
Our ASPA membership is large and brilliant. We can harness these resources to come up with solutions to these seemingly intractable problems and grand challenges. We have the brains and the energy. We just need to think carefully about how we go about it so we can be effective in our approach. I suggest that to contribute to solving the challenges of our time, we might want to consider Edward Berger and Michael Starber's book on thinking effectively. It took these mathematicians over two decades to solve a mathematical problems, nothing unheard of when it comes to mathematical questions. But after fry, trying and trying and trying and using all kinds of complex tools, their solutions came down to following five simple strategies. Return to fundamentals. Go back to basic, make mistakes and learn from mistakes. Three, raise questions. What is it that we're trying to solve? Follow the flow of ideas, don't stagnate. And above all, change. As scary as change can be, that's exactly what we need. With these five principles in mind, I would like us to harness the passion for public service of a membership to come up with solutions. I would like us to focus our energy on building resilient governance and resilient public administrations so we can develop resilient communities, which by the way, is going to be the theme of next year's conference. But this thinking would require that we are required that we transcend the maladies of inequity and injustices that have become a disgraceful part of the fabric of our society. Those maladies don't fit in a framework for building resilient communities. If we build resilient communities where members of society can bounce back from natural and human-made disasters and personal setbacks, it will help to change or at least ameliorate the negative perceptions that the state, uh, that we have about the state and improve the quality of citizens, of the lives of citizens and increase trust in government and democratic system. We need to focus on rebuilding this capacity so that it can do the work that it is supposed to do for the people it serves. And the importance of building capacity can be understated as reflected by, reflected by efforts of organizations like the United Nations with this UN 2.0, which focuses on workforce capability in what they call a quintent of change that includes building capacity in data analysis and communication, performance and resource orientation, which is something that uh, King County knows very well, and they do a great job about it. Uh, behavioral science, innovation, and digital transformation and strategic oversight. As highlighted by conference participants during the International Assembly at the ASPA conference, through the work of its members, ASPA has had an important role in public service transformation around the world. And some believe that ASPA has excelled at it. ASPA staffs and ASPA members through their sections and chapters like this one have consciously worked to focus on improving public service to better the lives of citizens, but we are called to do more. So implicit here is that ASPA is ASPA because of you, its members. ASPA provides a platform for its members, both practitioners and academicians to have an impact on society. And as such, for us to achieve societal level goals, such as building resilient communities, we need to engage with ASPA. And there are many ways to do this. I call you to consider participating in a national conference and sharing your knowledge. To help build a financially robust ASPA through your membership renewals, conference and sponsorships, and yes, even annual giving when you can. So we can continue this vital work for years to come. I call you to engage by mentoring young professionals, such as those who participate in this chapter and those who participate in ASPA's Founder Fellows and the Young Scholars programs. They are our future. I call on you to help us conduct skill-based webinars, which you are already doing some really good work about. Let's continue that. To conduct workshops for conference participants. And most importantly, I call on you to continue to be present mindful, intentional about the actions you take to realize your passion for public service. Thank you again for inviting me today. It is a privilege to be here with you today to celebrate the award winners. And I look forward to working with you in the next two years and beyond.
Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Patria. And wow, this is, I mean, in terms of an inspirational speech that um, I will potentially use in my lectures uh, that uh, justifies the value of public service. Uh, it only takes one class. It only takes one potential seminar, one potential lecture for students to see value in public service and to recognize that this is where we make change. So thank you for uh, this great opening for again solidifying the importance of professionalism and um, need for social change that we as public administrators really are in the driver's seat of uh, potentially making all of these changes and also want to thank you as a 2014 founders fellow uh, for um, donating our modus uh, honorarium that uh, we were able to put together as a chapter to invite you to um, speak and introduce the award ceremony and the recipients. Again, you decided that the best place to use those resources is to continue funding opportunities for uh, young practitioners through the Founders Fellows Program. So thank you very much for your donation. And I would like to now call on Mary so we can start um, recognizing our award recipients. Yes, thank you, Lucky. Uh, our first award today is the Outstanding Graduate Student in Public Administration Award, and I'm going to read a description of that for you. The Evergreen Chapter's Outstanding Graduate Student in Public Administration Award recognizes a student who is pursuing or has just completed a degree in public administration or related field in a master's or doctoral level graduate school program in a fully accredited college or university with graduation in 2022 or anticipated in 2023. The award winner will be selected based on nominations submitted on the student's behalf. We ask that nominators have an intimate knowledge of the student's achievements and commitment to the field of public administration. Letters of nomination are welcome from a faculty member, a program administrator, or a student colleague. And to introduce, our awardee, I would like to call on um, Ben Brunges and let me just tell you a little bit about Ben. My fellow board member, Ben Brunges, has been an ASPA member since April of 2015. He transferred his affiliation uh, from a chapter in Georgia to the Evergreen chapter, where he completed his PhD in public administration at the University of Georgia. Ben is currently an assistant professor at the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance, teaching graduate courses in public policy. In addition to his membership in ASPA, he belongs to the Association for Public Policy and Management, the International Association of Emergency Managers, and the International Public Management Network. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Mary, I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor today to introduce Crystal Song, the Graduate Student of the Year uh, for the Evergreen Chapter of ASPA. Uh, though I first met Crystal as an undergraduate student six years ago, uh, Crystal will graduate from the Evans School in June with a Master's of Public Administration. And she's made a substantial contribution to our school and to public organizations in Washington over the past two years. In her time at Evans, Crystal has exemplified academic excellence, a commitment to community advancement, and an unparalleled public service ethic. At Evans, she served as the elected chairperson of the Evans Student Council, the leader of our master's student body. In this role, she's represented student interests to the Evans School faculty, help to coordinate and oversee student events and manage teams of student volunteers, which we all know is a harder task than we all think when we start. Uh, much of her work is centered on promoting equity and student opportunities at the Evans School and at the UW more broadly. Uh, she's served on faculty search committees, moderated professional career panels, and identified funding opportunities for her peers. Her service to the University of Washington, to her peers, and to the Evans School has been invaluable over these years. Crystal has also during this time served as a teaching assistant, working with faculty, including me, to support both undergraduate and graduate level classes across our curriculum. 
In doing so, she's demonstrated a mastery of both the substance and the instruction of students in public administration topics. She routinely receives high, high marks from her students, with many noting her as one of the best teaching assistants they've had during their time at Evans. She's also helped design a new MPA course on racialized public policy, working with seven others, including faculty, staff, and peer students, to co-produce an experiential course on how institutional racism manifests in public organizations. This experiential class will take place next year in Birmingham and Montgomery, Alabama, and Crystal's contributions have been instrumental in the course design. But that's not all she's done at Evans. While doing these things, Crystal's also managed to work actively in the public sector. In 2022, she worked for the Nonprofit Association of, Wa of Washington, helping to design and implement a range of programs to aid nonprofits around our state. And beginning in 2023, she has served as a program analyst for the Council of State Government's Justice Center, where she performs research and analysis on racial equity in prisoner reentry programs and outcomes, supporting federal grantees, and helping to design and deliver awareness campaigns. Crystal is a natural leader, a phenomenal student, and a committed public servant. She's accomplished so much in her time at the Evans School, and I am certain that she'll continue to work to advance others and to make the world a better place for everyone, bringing the boundless energy she has demonstrated over these last two years. So accordingly, I'm honored to be able to introduce to you today, Crystal Song, this year's Evergreen Chapter Graduate Student of the Year. Congratulations, Crystal. Thank you, Ben. Um, those were really um, deep and thoughtful words, and um, I am quite speechless for that introduction, so thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for this generous award. Um, it's an honor to be recognized by the ASPA Evergreen Chapter alongside such accomplished individuals. I specifically want to thank Ben, who nominated me for this award. Um, ben was my professor, as he mentioned, for my very first intro to public policy class back in college in 2015. And at the time, I was unhappily on a pre-med track. Um, ben also was my professor again in my first quarter of grad school in fall 2021. Suffice to say that intro class in 2015 pivoted my career towards social justice and public service, specifically working to dismantle mass incarceration and advance racial justice. As Lucky said earlier, sometimes all it takes is one class um, to turn towards public administration. So it feels really serendipitous to have been nominated by the first person to teach me about public policy, let alone be selected and awarded by the Evergreen chapter. So thank you again for this year's Outstanding Graduate Award. Congratulations, Crystal. What an inspirational story. I am glad that we have so many examples of this one class, it takes one class to uh, really make you realize that we can make an impact and we can make an impact in a number of ways. But public administration, I believe, is where uh, we truly see the evidence of that impact. And what an inspirational initiative, co-designing curriculum that is going to be implemented. Congratulations. This is truly well deserved. And now I'd like to call on Mary for our next award. Thank you. And before we move ahead to the next award, I'll invite Brian to show a, a photograph of the award that you'll be receiving, Crystal. There it is. And that will be arriving in the mail to you. Our next award is called the Award for the Advancement of Collaborative Governance. The description reads, the increasingly disruptive approach to political decision-making has increased significantly since the early 1990s, reaching its most intensive level in the past few years. As a result, we have seen deadlocks in government at all levels, resulting in decreasing the effectiveness of governance. During the same period of time, a new form of government decision-making has emerged, one that involves not only the responsible government agencies, but many other stakeholders. This approach is growing quickly, but has not yet become a standard practice. This award honors organizations or individuals who have effectively promoted and engaged in this governance process, providing leadership for a program that is inclusive rather than exclusive, that resolves the differences held by the stakeholders and results in sustainable outcomes. 
Lucky, would you like to please introduce our awardee? Absolutely. It is an absolute uh, pleasure to introduce um, this year's award recipient, Abe Gardner. Um, and just briefly about mentioning the importance of collaborative governance. I teach uh, a range of curriculum sig similar to Ben and other faculty and collaborative governance often is a chapter uh, or a lecture in uh, a lot of our courses. And it's becoming a realization across the board that we need to work across boundaries because all of the difficult problems we're tackling are not respecting the borders and boundaries that we establish for organizations. Um, and collaborative governance is crucial. And that means we have to work within our agencies, but also externally with many rights holders and stakeholders and various associations that have know-how and abilities and are willing to work. But this, it takes skill. It takes um, abilities. And as Mary mentioned, it is not as prevalent, at least not yet, but it is on its way. We, Pre-COVID, I attended um, a seminar at the University of Pittsburgh where the late David Miller uh, and a number of scholars had identified uh, regional organizations solving problems in our communities. So not individual governments, but a cluster of organizations that are public in nature that work in regional initiatives because they recognize they cannot do it alone. And what they identified as a crucial factor in this work while interviewing many of the participants in, of these associations is our MPA curriculum was lagging in terms of getting them prepared for that type of work. So that's where we started thinking about incorporating more collaborative um, instruction and um, resources to support those public servants. When I came to the state of Washington, um, I became involved with uh, an initiative that is at the local level, at the county level, to reduce the opioid, um, the deaths of opioids uh, in a community that had one of the highest rates uh, in the state and had received a grant from the federal government, from the Bureau of um, Justice, to be able to work on programs to identify potential solutions. That's where I met Abe, Gar Abe Gardner. Um, Abe introduced me to agencies that um, are typically very uh, well aware of the problem and often we identify them as working solely in this, providing these solutions. Our task was to identify the scope of the problem, which means identify roughly how big is the problem, how many are the individuals that need tr uh, treatment and services, uh, and most importantly, what does the network look like? What does the network of service providers look like? And that's, that's not an easy task because that requires uh, talking to a lot of people across multiple agencies. And what Abe did that I have never seen, um, we have read cases, we have read examples, but it's, it's refreshing to see in person, is he walked to everybody's door and all of the doors opened. When I say all of these doors opened, uh, imagine a huge table that more and more people were coming to every week because something is happening. They're seeing possibility for change. Those stakeholder groups, of which one there is a meeting tomorrow that I will attempt to attend as well, um, that I still keep in touch with, grew in terms of the participants exponentially. And that was one of the findings of the report that we published, um, that more and more people recognize the need to work together um, and transcending boundaries. We had um, local law enforcement, and I don't mean uh, just from one agency, but from multiple agencies, the sheriff's department, the city police chief, were all there at the table asking for help because they let us know at the end of the day, a lot of people experience need for help, but they don't do it on a nine to five basis. And when they need that help, we have to respond along with the fire department, the EMT, who are also at the table, as well as um, that have to work and coordinate with behavioral health, mental health, housing, transportation, education, the hospital, the tribal nations that are also our community members as well and partners. So I got to speak with everybody. And what was truly amazing was how A was received by everybody. It just takes one person to build a network, being able to walk to every single door and open these doors because it is difficult. It is difficult to work across policy arenas and across organizational boundaries, but he made it seem easy. At one of the stakeholder groups that we were working together, he said everybody at the table, those were people that rarely sit in the table for a number of reasons. And he on the big white board basically said, okay, list what you have and list what you need. 
And when everybody was done doing their list, people just start drawing arrows. Give you an example of how we found one particular uh, solution that people knew was a problem, but didn't identify the core cause of the problem. Um, one individual, and this was not just one individual, there are individuals across, uh, across our communities that might experience this, needed treatment, water treatment, uh, was not willing to get into the treatment provider services because they wouldn't allow the pet. So at that point, it was like, how can we just remove that barrier, that burden to be able to uh, accommodate that individual who's not willing to part with their pet because there's nobody else who will take care of that pet? A solution was found, that person received services. So again, I can come up with many examples and stories over the past years that I've worked with Abe. And while we want to see in terms of materialization of collaborative governance, uh, I was privileged to be able to experience working along Abe and just watching how he talks to people and how people really work together when he's in the room. So Abe, congratulations. Thank you, Lucky. I uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, and you used the word privilege. It was a privilege to work with you as well. Um, I, I learned a lot um, and I greatly appreciate your uh, participation and your leadership. Um, while we were working on that project as well. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful for that opportunity. And, and thank you to the ASPA um, as well for this um, honor. Truly humbled and, and grateful. Um, and want to just uh, you know, uh, thank my employers. So I, previously I worked at uh, Mesa County Public Health and had some incredible leadership. Currently I work at the uh, North Mason Regional Fire Authority um, and again have some pretty incredible leadership. And uh, both uh, agencies and entities participate in creating solutions for our community um, and uh, really set uh, their employees up for success and allow for the opportunity to be creative um, and really uh, encourage to find uh, a way to say yes. How do we uh, best serve our communities and how do we set our employees up to do so? And, and I was the benefit of that. So incredibly thankful for Mesa County Public Health and North Mason Regional Fire Authority. Um, and of course, uh, none of this work could be done without a community that was willing to engage in conversation and was willing to uh, think outside the box and was willing to engage in um, different solutions and creative solutions, um, you know, at the policy level um, and at the 30,000 foot level so that it, it, it reached its way down to the, uh, you know, boots on the ground um, and really provided some opportunities for, for individuals to get the help and support they need um, so that they, they could be on the road to recovery. Um, so incredibly grateful to work in Mason County where there's some, some fantastic folks and some leadership positions that uh, are willing to engage in some great solutions. And uh, last but not least, uh, my wife is actually on this uh, uh, call. She, her, her boss let her take the time for her lunch to to jump on and, and uh, my family has been incredibly supportive and my wife in particular, and just uh, incredible, incredibly grateful for her support um, along the way, because I wouldn't be the uh, man I am today without her support and her love. So uh, thank you all and uh, I'm honored to be uh, a part of this uh, uh, afternoon and um, alongside all of these uh, very worthy recipients. So thank you very much. Great work, Abe. Keep up the good work. And I'll see you tomorrow, Lucky, at the meeting. <laughs> see you tomorrow. <laughs> and I would like to call on Mary for our next award. Thank you. And before we move on, I would like to ask Brian to show a picture of the award that you'll be receiving, Abe. Very nice. Thank you. Our next award is called the Call to Service Award. And we actually have two award winners in this category this year. The description reads, a life in public service is one of the most honorable and satisfying careers anyone could have. Despite this, many have shunned public service as a career or as an important part of a broader career. Others unfairly criticize public servants for their perceived lack of a strong work, work ethic because they feel they are overpaid, or perhaps because they believe that many of the services their government provides are not necessary. While some would reduce or eliminate some programs and public servants, 
most Americans would prefer not to eliminate, and yes, often expand the role of government. Whatever the sector, national security, local public safety requirements, health and welfare, the burden falls on public servants to provide these services, often in a hostile environment. This award honors those who have demonstrated the devotion to public service, either as a practitioner, as an academic who teaches and encourages students to enter public service, or any other individual who appreciates the value of public service and provides support and encouragement so that the best among us will follow this career path. And I would like to call on my fellow board member and also the vice president of our Evergreen chapter, Caitlin Upshaw, to uh, introduce her nominee. Thank you, Mary. Um, I would, it is my absolute honor to introduce Taylor Shahan uh, for the Call to Service Award. Taylor was my coworker from 2018 to 2021 at the Washington State Board of Accountancy. Uh, and he's still a very valued employee there now. Taylor is the lead investigator and he advises certified public accountants on what they can and cannot do. He also investigates allegations of misconduct uh, and he doesn't get what we would call the fun calls. When someone calls Taylor, it's usually in a panic. But his contributions go far beyond the job description. When we worked together, he would often take extra time to reassure individuals who called us, whether they were worried about a missed tax deadline or concerned about rules having been broken. I once watched him explain for 45 minutes how someone could log into their own email account to access our online system. Uh, when we worked together, his demeanor never wavered. With every person who con called us in a panic, Taylor would meet them with a calm. And the calm was not just reserved for patrons. Stressed coworkers knew to go to his desk for encouragement. During busy weeks, we'd often arrive to find freshly baked goodies in the fridge. When I was overwhelmed with emails or exhausted from evening classes doing my MPA, he would often and voluntarily take on some of my workload. There was one Friday where he declared that he wanted to learn how to make a cheesecake. And on Monday, we arrived to find 10 individually wrapped cheesecake slices in our community fridge, one for every single member of our staff. Though we often talk about public administration through an academic lens, Taylor exemplifies it, the true meaning of it in everyday work. In his continued tenure with the board, he's been a part of a numerous internal projects, system updates, hiring committees, pro-equity, anti-racism committees, legislative changes, and about six other dozen things. But more than that, he's managed to create an environment in which his coworkers and members of the public feel supported and equipped to thrive. The first week of the lockdown in 2020, when our office was modified to work from home, Taylor made a group chat for those of us working on the same day before we'd even started our work day. It might have had some actual discussions about how work was, but mostly what I remember were the daily check-ins, the genuine, how are you doing? the movie recommendations, the encouragement for all of us to step away from our little desks in our cramped living rooms to take a walk. Public service is not just about the people we serve, but about how we support and equip those around us in order to do that service. And Taylor gives the energy, encouragement, and the tactical baked goods to those around him. He understands that community is at the center of everything. And to put it simply, he is the quiet heart of his agency. The field of public administration relies on a trust between civil servants and the public. And if every civil servant was as passionate about helping people as Taylor is, our state would be all the better for it. I'm very excited to uh, have nominated you for this award, Taylor, and I can't think of anyone more deserving. Thank you so much for that warm open, Caitlin, and thank you ASPA for having me here and allowing me to be involved in this presentation. Uh, I first started at the board 10 years ago um, after the previous executive director gave a presentation to one of my high school classes, apparently. Took that one class to turn me down a path that I didn't know I would find myself on now. And now I can't imagine myself working anywhere but the public sector. Um, it's been an absolute honor to be here at the board um, where the landscape was 10 years ago and where it is today looks nothing the same. Everything's changing and updating and moving forward. and I'm just thrilled and privileged to be a part of that, where we have been and where we're going and every step of the way, and especially embracing Inslee's pro-equity, anti-racism, just making everything accessible and equitable to 
everyone in the state, whether they be CPAs, Washington state consumers, or people outside the state concerned about people in the state. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, all the kind words and all these wonderful presentations. Thank you. That's inspiring. Again, it just that the story of just one class, it takes just one class and it doesn't matter what, what level. Amazing work. And again, the, the personification of somebody who wants to make change and most importantly, learning um, not just about being improvements in public service, but also cheesecake. So one day, Taylor, we want to know some of the recipes. And I, now it's time for us to share the a visual of your award as well. And all of these awards are making their way to our postal services uh, delivered to an address that you have provided us with. Um, and this year we have two award recipients for a call to service um, recognition. Um, Council representative um, Kiara Daniels is our second representative uh, from the city of Tacoma. Um, I, I was Kiara's faculty at the MPA program. Um, and I'm always very clear about my bias when it comes to the curriculum we teach and where I stand. I'm a lot more in the management world more than the policy world. And I'm firmly um, situated in that realm, but I always tell my students where you make a change is you have to follow what the changes that is needed that you see for your communities. So last night um, I teach a class in Tacoma on urban government on herbal governance, and I try to get my students to become the next city managers of their jurisdictions or become uh, the leaders of those regional associations. And um, Kiara didn't go that route. Kiara went in a different route, but uh, I'm not disappointed. I'm extremely happy because she identified a need for change um, and she went head first into that need. Um, but she also called us out for who we are and what we do. Um, academically and how we need to be better. And I believe it was 2017, might've been 18. Um, COVID has made a lot of the years kind of blurry, but um, I remember being in seminar with Kiara and she asked me a very simple question. Lucky, why are we doing this? Naively, I started explaining the purpose of the reading, the nature of the seminar questions. And she was like, no, look at us. Look at what we're reading about. Look what is written by. And that was prior to a lot of the calls um, in our field to start looking at our curriculum and revisiting it and revising it. The representativeness was an issue. Um, the reality of the agencies that uh, we're working with was also, um, uh, there was a need for a change there as well. But Kara saw that there is also a need to represent communities that needed to be represented. So Kara ran for office. Um, and is now a council representative for the city of Tacoma, which is no small accomplishment. And not long ago, she was on TV, fe featured by the local media. When I say local, it's one of the local channels of a national affiliate, um, as somebody who is making a difference in the community by identifying the problems, working towards solutions, and being an exemplar of how we can make those solutions. So, Kiara, congratulations, and thank you for all you do to respond to that call to service. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you so much. I, um, I'm actually at work right now um, in the middle of a study session. And I just, first of all, thank you for reminding me of how outspoken sometimes I am and that I always forget that I am. Um, you know, I, I, originally went to school to try to just get a raise and try to kind of um, change my position at work. And it's so funny how studying how things are done and the way to properly manage uh, people and resources and how to help people lead has kind of pushed me into this place where I never thought I was going to be and really where I didn't want to be. But now that I'm here, it's, it's such a calling and it's such an honor to be here. Um, and really, it started from a place of wanting to help other, uh, wanting to help um, fund and resource other public administrators to be able to do their job better. And so um, I'm so grateful for all that I've learned. And I'm really, really, 
I'm happy to be in this position and, and happy to help inspire others to want to come to this side um, and so that we can work together and kind of uh, figure out this representation thing and, and, and find the quiet administrators who do all the work in the back and help them come to this side because we really need that representation here too. Again, congratulations on all the hard work you're doing. And yes, don't stop being that outspoken person that you are because that always stood out. <laughs> Thank you. And now we'll see your award as well. And next, uh, we have um, also our chapter um, has decided that we will be able to um, have an additional award this year, which is the the chapter president's award. Um, and this award is uh, for an individual um, who does public administration work and is actively engaged in service as a practitioner or academic um, and actively is promoting the ideals and objectives of not just our chapter, but also the National Association um, ASPA. And uh, the award, um, I nominated the recipient and uh, wanted to make sure that I tell the story of um, how it is that I have really seen this individual as a pillar of our community. And it's not just an academic setting, but in a, as a practitioner, as somebody who really lives in both those two worlds and really exemplifies um, a lot of work the public servants do that is difficult um, to document because they work tirelessly behind the scenes at all of the meetings that you go somebody has prepared the setting somebody is making sure that people are uh, guided into various locations uh, and most importantly somebody is being a human being and helping individuals in a number of ways a lot of this work goes unnoticed a lot of that labor goes unnoticed um and Kyle, um, who is currently a faculty at the Evergreen State College uh, with the Native Pathways Program, has done exceptional work, not just as a faculty member, but also as a community leader. Um, and somebody who promotes all of those values of uh, improved governance, uh, global citizenship, which means making sure that everybody feels um, welcome and promoting learning, a learning environment that is oftentimes obscure or not commonplace, but making it exciting. Um, earlier, we heard that, you know, oftentimes uh, mathematicians go back to the basics. And I think that is true for everybody in terms of getting people to be excited. And to tell you a little bit about uh, how I noticed Kyle as somebody who works tirelessly, um, being able to develop learning opportunities across a spectrum of curriculum is really important, but also being able to do so will teach us about where we are, who we are, and the importance of setting uh, and context is truly important. And he has excelled as a faculty member um, in a growing program at the, at the college, and also um, a graduate of our tribal governance concentration, somebody who is able to identify the needs of our curriculum as well as the needs of the communities and how we can bridge those two, because oftentimes it is not as easy for us to see. So as somebody who, who lives in those worlds, um, Kyle is an exceptional teacher. Um, and most importantly, he's an exceptional teacher, not just to us, helping us improve, but also at anybody. So I'll give you a quick story. Not long ago, uh, I had a friend of mine call me and say, we have a bus of high school students who was passing through the area they're going to be in western washington and they're visiting a whole bunch of cool places you know they're going to be on the coast and they're going to be stopping in olympia for half a day is there something they could do at the evergreen state college that can introduce them to uh, tribal knowledge tribal cultures sovereignty um and i was like oh, yes and i'm not sure i'm the best person for that uh for a lack of my own knowledge i uh, need for me to be a better better educated individual but also I'm not sure I can cap, I'm not good enough person to be, to captivate a bus of high school kids from Atlanta, Georgia. But I reached out to Kyle um, and to the uh, leadership of the um, Welcome House in our 
campus and I was like, can we have this venue and can, who would be the best person to do this? And Kyle was like, I would love to do this. I'm like, I was hoping you would say yes, but I was not going to ask you because I don't want to put it on you. But if you would like to hang out with a bunch of high school kids who are in the region and they've been learning a lot because they were coming from uh, the Quinault reservation. Uh, so they have been learning a lot along the way, but now it was time for them to come and really learn about the history, uh, not just of our region, but also nationally, uh, the importance of sovereignty and tribal lands and the relationships with various types of governments. Because it is in, oftentimes in that collaborative setting that we discussed earlier, the levels of governments and authority um, and laws are really interesting to examine uh, in terms of who the neighboring jurisdictions are and how we uh, communicate effectively. So that bus arrived on campus. Um, I met the, the stewards who uh, brought all of those kids on campus and it's a beautiful campus. But then I watched Kyle's presentation and I felt that I was in the class with Kyle. I was like, oh man, I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that history. And those kids were asking questions like, can you tell us about that place on the map? What about that time in history? They were captivated by somebody who typically teaches um, Grad, not undergraduate students at a college level, but he's able to grab an audience as nobody I've ever seen. So Kyle, for all the work you do, for all the educating you do that is often unnoticed. Thank you and congratulations. Uh, in the words of my people, Katsuyao, uh, thank you in the Nimi Putimp language, uh, the language of the Nez Perce tribe. Um, thank you, Lucky, for sharing that experience um, and, and all of your kind and amazing words. Um, thank you to ASPA, uh, to the fellow participants here on the call, and to the future generations who will hopefully follow in our vein by making contributions to our society through public service. Uh, I am very grateful and honored to have been selected for this award, especially in my first year of full-time teaching uh, at the undergraduate level. And having specifically gone through the tribal governance concentration um, of the MPA program at the Evergreen State College, like Lucky mentioned, uh, it is my desire to promote the intergovernmental cooperation between tribal nations and the various levels of American government. And as we look for ways to bolster our democracy across the nation, it is imperative that we remember to include the indigenous communities that have been exercising their sovereignty and operating their governments since time immemorial. So I look forward to continuing my form of public service, particularly by educating people about the unique status of American Indians and tribal governments. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle, and we get to see your award. Hopefully it's on its way as well. So you have it in the mail in the very near future. And with this, we're coming towards the very um, almost end of our program. So uh, I see the chat has a lot of congratulations for all of the participants. And we greatly appreciate you being with us this afternoon to recognize some of the amazing public servants in our communities. And there's uh, many, many more that we wanted to recognize, but um, there's only so much award space we have, uh, but we'll keep on um, working to make sure we advance all of the ASPA ideals uh, and keep working, as Kyle said, for um, learning and improving our position and promoting collaborative governance uh, and making sure that we take it one class at a time when we're in the classroom, uh, one interaction with constituents when we're out in public. And last but not least, um, we have a congratulatory message that we would like to share with all of the recipients. Hi, Governor Inslee here. It's my privilege today to salute five very fine public servants for the ASPA Evergreen Chapters Public Service Recognition Week. You selected some really great deserving names for these awards. Kiara is doing great things for the city of Tacoma. Taylor is known as the go-to guide with the Board of Accountancy. Abe is saving lives in Mason County, preventing overdoses. Crystal's work ethic has her at the top of the class. And Kyle is a, really an expert on our state's rich tribal heritage. We know public service takes so many forms and there's virtues in each one 
and you are proof. You're making a difference in Washingtonians' lives. Congratulations. Let's keep up the great work for the Evergreen State. Thank you all for participating. And once again, congratulations to all the award recipients. Um, this presentation has been recorded, but it's uh, and it will be available with a transcription as well. Um, uh, so you can share it with friends and family. And again, keep up the good work.